I have great pleasure next in calling on Dr. Salah Albanda, who has uh, been a guest of ours before, and we're delighted to see him again. Um, he's the author of the famous Albanda report, uh, which led to, uh, to the Bandergate Bander scandal, and we're delighted to welcome him again here now. Uh, I really would like to thank you, uh, Lord Avebury, for uh, consistent and unwavering support of the just cause of the Bahrain people and beyond. At the same time, I would like to thank the community activists who is coming every year from the front line to give us uh, a kind of uh, an eyewitness uh, account of what's going on in Bahrain. Indeed, the issue of human rights uh, and group rights violation in Bahrain is well documented by the United Nations, by the international human rights organizations, and by the national organizations as well. Again, it is indecent really to compare suffering. And I find it very difficult that a community of a country which is around half a million uh, uh, indigenous population is enduring such a consistent violation for the last uh, a few decades. If I put this in context, I counted in proportional representation the number of the detainees, the number of the people who was expelled from their jobs, and the number of the people who was really being put in trial or killed within the context of what we are living here in the UK under. And Believe it or not, that number is almost accounted to 1.5 million British people going through what the Bahraini people are going on for the last at least 10 years or so. So it is a horrific proportional representation of the scale of uh, uh, torture and killing and uh, indignation in Bahrain. I would like to make a few comments, but I'll focus in one significant issue at the end of my uh, comments. I can see there is no, in the horizon of the current political situation, any possibility for political settlement of what's going on in Bahrain. For only one reason, because the government and the authorities, including the royal court itself, are buying time by bringing this issue of dialogue from time to time. At the same time, they are carrying on their original plan. Through gradual co-opting of political forces and neutralizing the other major political opponents in the country, they are carrying on systematically that kind of plan. But their major interest and their focus is the political naturalization. And this is the critical point I would like to highlight today. Because it seems to me, for the Bahraini people, at the end of the day, they will come to realize if there is any possibility down the line, one day, within the coming five, maybe 10 years, to reach an amicable solution to the current horrendous situation, then the Bahrain we know, the Bahrain composition which we were familiar with for the last maybe uh, 200 or 300 years is completely different. At that point, it's going to be a fruitless political uh, uh, solution because the majority community of today definitely is going to be the minority community of tomorrow. I'll focus on two issues. The first one is the political naturalization. According to the plan which we uncovered in 2007, that has amounted to 50,000, a rate of a 50,000 naturalization per annum, which is, according to my uh, sources, today the Royal Court processed, processed around 360,000 applications of naturalization. So you can imagine now that for the last eight years, the composition and the demographic profile of the, indigen the, of the indigenous population is tremendously changed. On the other side of the equation, 
they are playing a very subtle game because the issue for them is the identity of Bahrain as we know it. And the identity of the Bahrain as we know it, it is getting to be the serious issue of contest. They are contesting this sense of identity because the majority community is, has been seen for almost 200 years as a serious threat. So they are trying to play on this element subtly without being even surfaced in the radar of the political forces in Bahrain and outside the country because they are easing the visa and regulation of residence for the Sunni uh, uh, foreigners in the country. At the same time, gradually deporting hundreds of the Shia foreigners who is coming into the country and contributing in the Muharram and the religious festivities of the majority community. They are doing this aggressively to the extent that when I look to the statistics, I've seen very interesting uh, pattern of issues coming in. That since the 40s, and up to the 70s, the percentage of the foreigners were ranging between 18 to 20 percent of the population, of the total population of Bahrain. And since 2000, that kind of proportion raised to be around 38 percent. And I'm saying this out of my notes, which I've been uh, taking for years now during my involvement as uh, advisor in strategic planning for the Royal Court. Today, the number of the foreigners in Bahrain is almost amounted to 60% of the population, which is by all means beyond 1.3 million residents of that country. By reducing the component of the Shia foreigners gradually, without being noted, and increasing and easing the regulation and of residence and the visa requirement for the Sunni, who is mostly coming from North Africa, Egypt, Gaza Strip, Jordan, uh, Palestine, and Syria and Iraq, and Pakistan to a large extent. They are trying to bring some sense of a psychological dominance of an overwhelming Sunni culture. And that is what I named and termed as a sectarian apartheid, which has been going on gradually since 2005, without being focused on, despite all the horrendous issues of human rights violation. But I think Bahrain is changing now significantly, despite uh, our consistent warning. And it's very interesting to see that the chief of the Dawasir tribe now is in control of the double number of people from Dawasir than the ruling family itself. So you can see now, even the enclave of the Saudi influence, which the British during the 30s and 40s worked hard to limit and contain, now it's getting its grip and the Dawasir uh, uh, tribal chiefs are really the people who's dictating what's going on on the ground at the moment in terms of majority, because the average number of the royal family according to the statistics is around 50,000 individuals. That's including every single member of the royal uh, family according to the department who is responsible about their statistics in the royal court. Now, I think it is very serious issue for every single group who is campaigning uh, for uh, a change in Bahrain. I, I, I do believe the issue of human rights is, 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 is important. We are, all of us, we are trying to raise these issues. But it is very odd. And I find it very difficult for the last few years, working in a high level advocacy for the people in the United Nations, in the European Union, working with some Western countries about the issue of the demographic profile of Bahrain and how this issue is not surfacing. And it's not really getting uh, the interest because most of these organizations, the issue of demographic makeup is out of their mandate. It is not a particular issue. It is very odd for the international community to face such uh, an experiment. It happened before uh, uh, during the 70s in Kuwait without being noted. And we know, all of us, we know that the political uh, naturalization of individuals in, in, in Kuwait 
uh, during the 70s uh, played a very significant role in changing the profile of, of the country. Most of these individuals I talked to for the last few years, they are not familiar with such a terminology. They are not familiar with such a procedure. So I would urge the political forces and the friends of Bahrain around the globe is to try to explain to the establishment in the Western countries and the European Union that by the end of the day, when al Wifaq and the other political powers coming in to talk about a political settlement, they would realize that the Bahrain, which they are talking about, the aspiration of the community which they are representing for almost uh, 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 many years, they are no longer having that uh, uh, presence and they are out of uh, uh, the political equation. I would hope I will go today back to my home and the issue of political naturalization in the mind and the agenda of every single person of you. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Almanda, for the work that you did and for the work that you're still doing in trying to call attention to what is in innately a very difficult problem because as you point out I mean there aren't any United Nations uh, mechanisms by which uh, uh, a wholesale attempt to change the demography of a country uh, can be raised um, that doesn't come within an, any clause of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or, or if it's equivalent the International Covenant on Economic, so Social and Cultural Rights but only it is a gross violation of the rights of the indigenous people of Bahrain, and, and there ought to be uh, ways in which it can be drawn to the attention of the international community. So I personally agree with you that it's a major problem that we all have to confront, that however much we go on about human rights, the situation in a few years' time will be that you have a Sunni majority in, in Bahrain, and that they will be able to enact whatever laws they choose, uh, with the able to say that they are fully democratic uh, um, and that, that they can ignore uh, the wishes of the indigenous population. So thank you very much, Dr. Alabanda, for drawing our attention to that phenomenon.